Okay. Um, so just I'm um, going to share my screen um, with the application itself, if I can find it. Can everyone see this? Yep. Okay, so I just wanted to at least give an idea of the application. I don't know if everyone's seen this or not already, but... Um, it's basically a couple of things that wanted to go over. Um, and uh, can you increase, Elliot, can you increase the... Um, yeah. Let me, I mean, I've seen it, but... So. Yeah. Let me see if... Um, does that do anything? trying to increase it. Not sure why it's not doing it in this view. Um, unfortunately, it seems like I can't, um, unfortunately, um, but I will just um, just go over, um, just go over it fairly quickly. So we're based, we just wanted to go over a couple of things for the um, application. Hopefully it's a little bit straightforward. So at the beginning, we basically were just talking about, so there's a, a different components that we can fund under the ESG program. One is street outreach, another is emergency shelter. And there is a, there is a category with homeless prevention. Um, we do have another category with rapid rehousing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the differences um, a little bit later going forward. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is that all of the funds needed to go to Lowell residents um, that make up to 30% of the AMI. Um, this is key because even if you might get residents from, let's say, Chensford, Billerica, or other communities, these funds can only go to Lowell residents. We do have a list of what the 30% AMI is. So for a, per, a one, one person, it's only 28,200. And then it goes all the way up to eight people or more, 53,130. Um, just a little bit about the street outreach thing. So it's basically, if you guys are going out to within the community and actually trying to engage uh, the homeless population, this would be under the street outreach category. Um, the other thing is like emergency shelter. I'm not really sure if anyone on this call would be doing emergency shelter, but that would be like units at like House of Hope or low transitional center where they actually have a place where people can sleep overnight. Uh, so that would fall into that. I mean, there's categories that people would fall into where it's like you could provide like job training programs or like shelter operations in the other. So, and as well as like any sort of like if you needed to have a shelter renovation, um, any repairs done in the shelter, that would be fall under that category. With regards to homelessness prevention, one of the things that we could do is you guys could provide like travel expenses to a person to possibly live with residents in another state, um, another community, or possibly prevent like rental rearage, such as with um, such similar to what CTI does it's, um, with the RAF program. Um, we do do short and medium um, 
versions of um, rental assistance, but the key for that is the city can only prov- we can only fund um, places that essentially meet the state um, habitation code. So if they can get an occupancy permit from the city or the community by which they reside, uh, which they are going to. Um, and the and the other thing is it cannot be more than the fair market rent. So we do have the units don't have to be in Lowell. They could be anywhere within the balance of state continuum of care, which has about uh, I I think it has about uh, seventy five communities or so going from all the way from like Newburyport to um, I believe like Brockton or things to that area. So it is a wide range of, um, it is a wide range of communities that people can, can go to. And then um, rapid rehousing. Um, this is similar to the homeless prevention. However, there is a slight difference with this, whereas like we can provide, um, I mean, you, basically you can provide startup costs with this, um, as well as there's also small minutia of um, residents that can fall under this, whereas like homeless prevention. Um, I know Sandra will talk about that in a little bit with our PowerPoint presentation that we do another power. PowerPoint presentation that we do have just to make sure that people are familiar with um, with the with the slight differences in each. One of the things we can pay for is an HMIS, um, but that is a, not a standalone category. Um, so if you plan, if you do get funding under one of these, I mean, you could get money to get trained in uh, and to enhance your capacity to use the VESTA program, which the Balance of State CLC has, because one of the requirements is that everybody joins the coordinated entry system um, that are using the, the ESG funds. The only ones that don't have to use it is um, those that are dealing with um, victim service providers. Uh, so people that deal with like um, domestic violence issues. So we get an allotment of about $170,000 each year. Um, so the regulations basically say that 60% of the funds can go, can go towards emergency shelters and street outreach. Uh, we are looking at only um, providing 55 percent of the of the cap towards those types of services because we really want to use a housing first model um, which is what the state also uses as well to get people really into a unit or prevent them from going into a shelter especially considering uh, the homeless crisis that I'm sure everybody is aware of. I mean, we want to keep the people in a home um, instead of, or get person into a home instead of necessarily have them go to a shelter, which is already at capacity. Um, again, all of the residents need to be Lowell, origi originate, uh, originally from Lowell, um, and the households can only make 30% of their income um, of the AMI. Um, we, so we would require that, um, we do require that everybody uh, becomes part of the HMIS system with the coordinated care, uh, continuum of care, which is the VESTA program. Um, but once you get funded, we can go more into that uh, to get you guys up to speed if you don't know what it is or or have used it before. One of the things that we do require is that 100% match um, from non-ESG sources. Um, so if you provide, um, let's say, $10,000 
and arrearage funds, we would just need to make sure that um, the match could um, that that you a lot of times it's easier just to do salaries because with non federal uh, with essentially non ESG sources, most a lot of people don't necessarily provide the funds usually can't cover a full time salary anyways for a person. So whatever contribution that is made towards like fringe salaries or other expenses for the program, um, you could put in there. One of the things um, is the deadline for the pro for the application is December 15th. So that gives you guys a, about three weeks or so um, to do the application. Uh, funds won't be available until July 1st. So that's the biggest thing. Um, we do have to provide um, HUD, because it's all federal funds. Um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development needs to get our basically how our allocation plan to them by uh, May 30th, so we could start to use the funds by July 1st. Granted, right now with the way Congress is, um, I'm hoping that we would know what our final award amount would be by May, uh, so there wouldn't be too much of a delay, but as with everything goes on DC, um, it's a waiting game to find out how much the total allocation would be. So some of the information that we do have on here is basically just an overview like our, of the RFP, as well as um, our evaluation criteria. So those are based in the two documents that you see here and here. Um, we do have, I mean, most of this is fairly self-explanatory what it is with the only thing someone might not have is a UEI number, which is where you get that from the federal government that replaced the, um, the Dun and Bradstreet number that you might have had um, as of April, I believe, of last year. Anyone who receives federal funds needs to get a UEI number. Um, and the, one of the things that we do ask is that the programs that you guys are are asking for, um, we do ask that you make sure that you only choose one component because it's a lot, when we do a contract, it's a lot easier for us to uh, to do a contract on that because if you try to do a program that might fit into different categories. Uh, we will have to work with you on that if you get funded, but um, it would be a lot easier for everyone's sake uh, just to uh, choose one category or another. I know if you're uh, trying to do rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention, um, if you have a question of which component you should be using, just reach out to Sandra or myself. And then most of the answers, I mean, questions are basically uh, numbers and um, a narrative. Um, so on the, the issue of like the individuals and families, the number could possibly be the same it might not depend in, um, if you're doing individuals, the numbers are gonna be the same if you work with families. Um, the higher number should be the individual count rather than, rather than the family count. Um, The other thing, one of the things that we do ask as well is like to get your policies and procedures um, for like how you handle like an appeal process and things to that nature. I mean, it could be simple as um, 
people can do it in writing or things to that nature, um, appeal in writing, or if it was like an EA, um, that they could go to the EA shelter and ask for um, and ask for appeal that way. With regards to the HMIS, if you guys haven't used it before, um, you could basically um, just basically talk about like how you get the information for the clients um, through your intake process. Because I'm assuming some of you guys, well, some of the organizations that might be on the call at first would be first time users of the HMIS program. Um, all of these actually are um, required fields. So if there's nothing that is is applicable for you guys, just use NA. And then one of the questions about project metrics, um, we were thinking about doing a table before, but with the way this system is the website version it doesn't allow us for a table so where's the project project metrics basically just this is mostly for a lot of times for the ones working in shelters but if you could say if you're not doing a, um, a shelter um, just let us know um, how many people you basically served and how basically served and um, how many you guys had successful, um, basically successful interactions with. And if you are a shelter and talked about exit destination, we are basically looking to see if they got an apartment or if they were moved in with family or friends. So that's what the exit destination means. Um, if you do do, I don't know, if you don't have to do a single audit for the federal government, um, the only thing that we do ask is that you guys provide your financial statement. Um, but if you do have the single audit, because um, I know the Lowell school system does, it's probably with the, the city of Lowell's. I mean, I'm assuming CTI definitely has one, so just provide that there. And then we have a space for program budgets. So one of the things that I will um, let you know, and I'm actually going to um, – actually, Sandra, do you want to talk about the program components and the differences – mostly with the differences between um, the rapid rehousing and the homeless prevention? Yes. Uh, okay. So, but not the budget, right? Just the the categories. Yeah. Um. Okay. One second. I have that in hard copy too. So. Okay, I think um, you can hear me, right, everyone? Hi, I'm Sandra. Hi, so um, there's links, just so you know, um, in the application, the ESG application, we have links. So I think Elliot just clicked on it. So there's a link, and, like, you probably can't see it that well on the screen now, but, like, when you click on it, you'll be able to pop it up to full, to the full size. Um, oh, thanks. So I have a hard copy here. Um, so... Yeah, I guess I'll go give an overview on the components, but Elliot already did a good introduction. Um, so I don't think anyone here is going to do street outreach this time, but possibly. But yeah, street outreach is basically for the homeless. It has to be for people who are like unsheltered, so people are sleeping in cars or on the streets. And then we can, would, these are the, like for example, on the budget you can put, um, for engagement, but engagement just is actually for 
working with the homeless who are on the street or in the cars and trying to get them connected to services or giving them basic needs. Um, and yeah, and then case management and emergency health services. We couldn't fit everything in the <clears throat> application, but like there's small print from HUD that says we can't, basically it's if there's no other resources to connect them to emergency health services. So that's only if like you can't find any other resources to connect them with it. Um, same with emergency health. And then transportation is, just keep in mind it has to be, that's going to be on the PowerPoint later, but we're going to have to have documentation for that. So that's kind of, sometimes um, people just don't, they forego that line item just because it's a lot of paperwork to do uh, because we have to know that they're, it's actually being used for the the homeless clients and then they're using it for services. So some places use logs, like you can say, see who, like there's a, a log that it associates it with the client. Um, special populations is basically like domestic violence, uh, victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence and like, um, HIV AIDS um, but then again the caveats like this shouldn't supplant other federal resources that are out there okay and then I can go into the so when Elliot keeps on talking about component that's what he means these um, eligible main activities because HUD breaks it out into like four or five and we have to report report based off of the component to HUD for the spending um, so emergency shelter yeah, is basically the more run of the mill, the what you're probably used to. Um, hearing for ESG, that's just like for existing shelters and paying for operating costs, case management, a lot of salaries, basically, and again like su supportive services, like legal services, mental health, kind of similar to above. Renovation is very tricky because, like, normally, honestly, ESG is not used for that just because it's such a small dollar amount. And then it just usually, like, I would I would suggest that you reach out to us before you even think about applying for that because normally it doesn't, um, it's not a good use of the funds because of all the requirements and we can award that much for that. Um, but it's usually for a minor, if, if anything, it would be for, like, minor things like maintenance. Um, like I would think C CDBG is probably better used, honestly, for renovation. Um, then shelter operations again, which is basically maintenance, um, rent, like the cost of renting the space for housing people in the shelter, food, like if you provide food to homeless people. Um, yeah, basically that. And then also hotel motel vouchers is because like I know like this day and age there's not enough sometimes there's not enough room in the shelter so then you have to house people so we can reimburse hotel motel vouchers. And then the more nuanced ones are rapid rehousing and homeless prevention. So the thing with rapid rehousing I guess the way you have to think about it it's more like housing first type of model. So it's for people who are already homeless. Um, and then the thought is to get them permanently housed. So they, by permanent housing, that means like stably housed, like into a longer term, like into a lease agreement at a, for example, they, you, you set them up with a lease with a, you find a place for them to rent and then you pay, they, we can pay the landlord. Um, the rent assistance fees so that's what short to medium term rental assistance is it's like basically paying for the rental payments once you find them housing rent arrears is if they have like a history so it kind of doesn't really make that much sense like seeing rent arrears here because they're supposed to be homeless but it's listed here in case they like they have a rec track record of having um like you know you want to clean, clean up their history um, so if they owe like a former landlord money, then we can pay that. Um, so it's actually pretty similar to homeless prevention, what's eligible, but you just have to think about, oh, sorry, can you scroll up still a little bit? Yeah, so um, 
it's similar just that it's like you have to think about who's who are you assisting who's eligible um yeah so basically rental assistance and then rent application fees you know like that's kind of straightforward just to get them housed somewhere security deposits last month's rent we also can pay for utility deposits if those are needed and payment moving costs is only like if if it's a reasonable like it has to be somewhat reasonable at least so I, you would probably have should ask us before that gets um put in a budget um and then the service costs are fairly similar it's like case management I'll, I'll, again and then connections to other services they need to get back on their feet and homeless prevention is the eligible activities are similar to above but it's basically trying to prevent people who are at 30 percent and below average medium income to getting put on the street or into emergency shelter so they're we're basically trying to keep them in their place if possible, keep them um, in their, whoever they're renting out of, to keep them housed where they are. Um, and also, sometimes you can rehouse them somewhere else to another rental unit, like find another landlord who will work with them. So the costs are similar. Again, it's rental assistance. And then the rent application fees all over again, utility. And then service is basically like like case management, um, some cases legal services, credit repair. So, Sandra, I think the the main the only difference between oh, yeah. the, two, the only difference between, one thing. the only mm -hmm. difference between the two is homeless prevention is for people that are at risk, rather than rapid rehousing is that it's people already homeless. I mean, that's really the only difference between the two. Yeah. So that's, I mean, so it real. that's why I said it's a little bit nuanced with exactly how, um, how HUD, well, the federal government classifies it. Oh, yeah, and we forgot to mention, I mean, Ellie already mentioned it, but they have to be City of Lowell residents. But I believe Elliot can correct me. But if they're literally homeless, there's not. It's kind of hard to document if they're actually low resident. But but the one to worry about more about this is the homeless prevention that the lease has to say city like located within Lowell. But if needed, we can rehouse them in a place outside of city of Lowell as long as it's in the continuum of care service area. So that's what Elliot meant earlier. Like if they have to get rehoused to drink it some then that's fine but they have to be when they're about to be evicted they have to be living in in Lowell um yeah so HMIS I don't think I have to get that much detail because he already went over a lot of it but that's the homeless management information system that HUD's requiring us to have all the the program beneficiaries be part of um that's eligible, but only if it's only if you apply to one of the other components above. So this would basically be like a subline. This would be a line item in the budget. Like it wouldn't be a standalone thing you're applying for. And then I want to say, but don't take my word 100% to this, but I believe if you joined VESA, I think it's free, the training and then getting on board. So it, I don't think there's need to get many cost associated for this one i mean i don't think there's any from what i heard it's um it should be yeah you should get the, at least the basic training for free and then joining the system should be shouldn't have a fee to it and i think that's about it unless elliot wants to to add no i mean okay. i think I think the only thing is we can go over a little bit is just that slight. We just want to give everybody an overview of like the reporting guidelines a little bit, just so you know, just so you guys have an idea of what you're in for. If you do get the application, um, if you do get funded, I'm just trying to 
get into that. So it just basically we do have like a five member team. Um sorry, six member team now. Uh and I mean this is just basically the only there's only three people that you guys if you did do get funded you're gonna be working with would be Sandra, myself, and our um Ann Reem, who actually just started uh yesterday. Um so basically most people prob probably know um, the ESG is one of the only other federally funded um, shelter, um, basically shelter funds that the federal government has. Um, it was, it combined with the, the McKenney Vinto, um, basically in 87, um, some of the regulations changed during the Obama age. Um, it used to be called the emergency shelter grants, but now it's emergency solutions. Um, the city of Lowell first received the money for this entitlement program in 1990 and it's been, well, 33 years now. So, I mean, it's been a while since we've gotten it. Um, just basically, we've already talked about this a little bit just with the homeless comp uh, with all the components but just a reminder that all the residents uh, that receive the funds must be from Lowell um, and again like the uh, approximate is 175 so we're looking basically I know it says up to 60 percent but the but we're looking at more like 55 percent for the shelter components and then the the remainder after the administrative fee of the 13,125 uh, would go to anything for rapid rehousing and homeless prevention. So again, um, we are, this is just a little bit more in this PowerPoint of what the, um, the PDF talks about. But again, for nothing, uh, none of these funds that are used for ESG can be duplicate, uh, can replace any of the feder existing federal sources that you guys have, or even the city of Lowell's funding. So these have to be used for standalone. Yeah, and then this is again is basically talking about like the AMI uh, with the homeless prevention and then rapid rehousing and just the differences is um, rapid and just rapid rehousing is for those that are actually already homeless versus homeless prevention. They're at risk of homelessness. Um, and then this talks a little bit about the HMIS system. So like some of the costs could be having a staff member paying some of the salary for someone to do data entry. I'm like what um, Sandra says, if, if it is best, there is free with, with some training and um, the actual license or subscriptions from the continuum of care, um, then the only thing it would would make sense to ask for um, salary, some of the salary costs to have that person input all the data. So with regards, and this is where it gets a little bit more nuanced with the definition by HUD. 
Um, so basically the homeless prevention is that when we talk about at risk of homelessness, it basically means that within 21 days of when they apply, the person's literally going to be out on the street. And you could use documentation as like a 14-day notice or um, or the judgment, summary judgment that the courts provide. Uh, but we would need documentation like that in order to determine that this person or this family will be literally homeless within that time period. Um, Rapid rehousing is basically those that are homeless but will be able to move into a unit within a month. So that is the main that is the main differences of the two um, of those two components. Um, basically, again, the balance of state. Um, I think it's like 75 communities within it. Um, like I said, anywhere from like Newburyport all the way down to the Taunton area or somewhere around there. So it is fairly dense. Um, and then everybody must um, be um, part of the coordinated entry system. So once you get VESTA, uh, that would suffice. Um, so for backup documentation purposes, um, this is where it's like I definitely wanted to make the for documentation purposes just to make sure you guys know what you will be into. Um, so like rental or rearages, let's say if you do provide that, we would need the lease and and or something from the the landlord or or the court system showing how much they are behind. I mean, it would be better if we could get like a, a rental ledger, but I know if it's a mom and pop um, landlord, they might not have that, but a letter would suffice showing how much they're owed. Um, the other thing is we also would want to make sure that we get case notes. Um, because we, because this is like kind of key because depending on where they're from or where they move to, we kind of need to make sure that the costs are eligible, such as, um, for example, if you're doing a diversion for like rapid rehousing, let's just say, um, or well, I would just say homeless prevention that you guys made every effort to either try to have them stay in the unit or have them move somewhere else. So that's one of the documentations that we would need. Um, if you guys do provide costs for a person to move to a new unit, we would need to make sure that you guys check to, that it's reasonable, the cost. Um, we could provide the fair market rent for the location of the property. So the fair market rent, let's just say if you go to Newton, that would be based on the Boston rent rather than the rent in the Lowell area. Um, so that's one thing to be mindful of is that depending on where the unit is, um, we would need, you guys might want to reach out to us to see where it would fall under, but if you go to HUD user, um, they do provide the fair market rent in the in the communities by which the metropolitan statistical area fall falls into. Uh, so most of the communities around this area, um, outside of like Lowell, Drake, Tingsboro, Pepro, um, and like the Methuen area would mostly fall under the Boston Metropolitan Statistical Area. So most of the most of the units would fall under that if it's not within the Greater Lowell or Greater Lawrence area. Um, if utility payments, we do need to have like the shut off notice from uh, from the utility company and proof of payment, and then, and we would need proof of payments regardless for for any other components. Um, 
but none of the funds can essentially sh- essentially um, go to um, the client. I'm sure most people don't provide direct uh, direct funds to the clients, um, so I'm really not worried about that. Um, one of the things is if the organization does pay um, by a credit card, I mean, we would just want to see the credit card statement, um, but everything could be redacted except for that particular charge to make sure that it clears. Um, so we would basically just ask, um, we would just ask for like a, a, when we do the contracts, you guys would have to report on what you spent the money on. Um, for us, it's a lot easier for uh, to do an itemized billing uh, just because uh, it's just easier for us to know when we do the reimbursement um, that all the uh, all of the charges of being essentially um, eligible. And one of the things that we do also ask is you guys don't have to provide, let's say the client name. Uh, we just want to have some sort of like unique ID when you guys provide us the itemized bill to say who the clients were. Uh, so if it's like John Smith, instead of saying John Smith, we would want to say like, Client A B C D one two three or something to that nature, um, just so the their privacy is maintained. Um, one of the things this is definitely this is definitely key is that if you once the contract is written, we wouldn't you cannot change the components. I mean, we've had unfortunately some organizations that change the components for what they build on um, without contacting us first. So, and that was mostly, I think, with regards to like the COVID funds. But I mean, if you need to have any amendments made to the contract, please reach out to us and we can work on that. And then that is it. Um, let me, how do I, I think there might be some questions. Okay, I didn't see. Oh, oh okay, there in the chat. Um, oh, oh, Amy um, gave the link for the. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Amy. Information. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to provide that at one point too, but thanks, it's right here. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah, I think. I think that is it. I mean, if you think of stuff, well, of Amy course, along the way. Amy has a question. I have quite, I have a couple of questions. I just, I, I'm trying to find where my little raised hand is. Are you <laughs> ready? Elliot? I don't know where it is either. So I. Mean, <laughs> are, are you ready for the list? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think Elliot okay. has to cut out early. So like if that happens, I can stay and then. Okay. I'm going to ask, too. then let me ask just more of the, the procurement piece versus the program piece, Sandra. Number one, Elliot, are you guys not providing us with a budget template? Um, well, I think for us, you guys could create your own. I mean, because it's mostly going to be programmatic costs. Um, okay. So I just no, I just want to make sure because there is no budget template anywhere on the thing, and I want to make sure that you're you're expecting us to design and create our own correct. budget template. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, number two, are there in the in the because of the issues we had with the portal before, are there character limitations in the narrative in that portal? Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think there there is. Um, oh, this year, I don't think we do. Let us know, though, if you do find one. But last year, because we had to do um, um, PDF. I don't yeah, think but I think that. this was because this of the issues with the CDBG one. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this should be. A, I will double check, but I don't think so. I mean, but I could check tomorrow. I mean, I think if there are character limitations, just adding them to the Definitely. website to let yeah. people know up front, because I think most people are going to be working off portal. Yeah. And then putting back in portal. So that would just be helpful yeah. to add if there are character limitations. Um, can I just ask, Elliot, because we had a program before that was rapid rehousing. And our issue that we ran into with the city was that we were not getting reimbursed for units if they were outside of the city. When did this policy this change? Year. 
And was it a city of Lowell change or was it a HUD change? Um, basically, HUD HUD always had it um, where um, this was more of an internal decision rather than a HUD okay. decision. Because we, you know, a couple of years ago, we ran the rapid rehousing and we we that was where we ran into a lot of yeah. problems with the rapid rehousing program being required to have units be in the city of Lowell. Yeah. So that's yeah. been that's been removed. Yeah. Yeah, we okay. figured we wanted to expand it so it's a little bit more accessible because no one, <laughs> the way with okay. the house it is. Okay, no, I, I'm I'm happy with the change. And again, I dropped the link in. If people go into that link, that's the balance of state. And you can click on the map and everything in yellow is the balance of state COC. So it's a very large opportunity area. Um, you said something about not for, um, that that you didn't, that these programs, I think you said, needed to be standalone. And I think we had a vision of something where we were going to back off and add a component and be able to leverage it with some of our um, COC money, but it would be a it would be a melded. Yeah, position. no, that that's fine. I mean, okay. it, it's using COC, but it's mostly what I was mostly saying that we would prefer people not to do like rapid rehousing and homeless prevention. Okay. So you're saying, but you're saying you want, you, you would be um, open to seeing leveraged resources using other funds. Yeah. So even because I, again, this is a very small amount of money and I think it's very far, mm -hmm. hard for anybody to, to fully fund a staff person or you don't want to tie a staff. Like, so being able to leverage other dollars for that would be, would be a good idea. Um, okay, so the only other question I have is that with the, uh, I think Sandra answered it with the HMIS piece, we could add personnel in there, but it's within that component and it's only what we would need to do the HMIS, quite frankly, data entry. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but it has to be, um, Elliot, it doesn't have to be part of, like, for example, they have to have been already applying for a rapid rehousing. Yeah, that's what she or, already mentioned. Yeah, that. okay. Just making sure. No, I don't mean, uh, Sandra, no, I don't mean having any kind of standalone HMIS because you wouldn't have any programmatic activity tied yeah, to it. Yeah, because we need to report numbers, like, of people. Right. So if we were, let's yeah, say for us, if we were doing either rapid rehousing or doing prevention work, we would look at the, we would look at the number of clients we're projecting and take a percentage of our HMIS staff or data entry person and apply it to the grant. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I think that's it for me. I just wanted to really make sure about the budget piece. Thank you. Not a problem. You're welcome. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I think I read somewhere that if we are, you know, first time, and we are thinking, uh, first time <clears throat> applicant be uh, required to have a TA. Well, if you but, want. If you want one, you can. I mean, it's just just to make sure. I mean, I, I guess we could call this the TA. I <laughs> mean, because basically we gave all the information that we would have required um, for the organization because we really wanted to make sure just because of the nuanced approach with the way HUD has it, we really wanted to make sure that organizations really knew the documentation purpose um, because we also don't want to, I mean, I, you guys do wonderful work. We also don't want to necessarily be like, oh, after you get a contract that we can't reimburse you because this, uh, your documentation is bad. Yeah. Yeah, I would be interested in that some, some follow-up meeting because I don't want to take time here. Yeah, that's fine. Or about the MHIS stuff and things like that. Yeah, that's always fine too, yeah, with us. And then Heather, sorry, I don't know, I made it. <laughs> Amy did have a follow up question, but yeah, are you I done know. though? On, um, sorry, are you done speaking? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can, yeah you, so you, to Satya's point, I just think, I think the TA piece, the critical part of this is to understand what the data, data collection is. And um, I, I did have a question for you, Elliot and Sandra. Had you considered, um, in this case, you've requested providers to upload their um, their intake form, right? That was one of the yeah. applications upload. Well, yet you're demanding them, which rightly so, through HUD to use the VESTA system and the HMIS system, which has yeah, some a of that's already in there. I think you're getting at yeah. Sorry, I'll let you speak. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning there is a standard HMIS 
application form that everyone, if you're going through the VESTA and the COC are required to use. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, I mean, we just pulled ours down, got it from them. We're going to PDF it. But I guess my question is, isn't that the requirement that people, you know, versus people running around trying to create a form when in fact they don't need to, there's a standard form and you guys are requiring to, you know what I'm saying? Isn't well, it? I think it's also um, for us to get an idea of what data that they're trying to collect if they haven't, if they're not already using the HMIS, um, just to make sure that they co that they're able to collect it. I mean, we could, don't necessarily need to make that a required field. Um, if they do want to, because I just want to make sure, again, like once they start the the applications and stuff like that, that they start off on the right foot. And I think that's the that's more the reason why we were asking them for the intake for the intake form. So we're gonna we'll make that not required um, if you're already using the HMIS system. Um, but organizations can provide it if they want. Well, I guess I guess I was sort of flipping that around, Elliot, and okay. saying, wouldn't wouldn't you want as part of the real sort of education to providers of what is required to provide it to them? Yeah, I mean, we don't have the we don't have access to Vesta, so that's the only okay. thing. That's the only reason why we can't necessarily provide it, but it does, but that is a good, I mean, if you by any chance have it that you can provide it to us, since I know CTI does have ESTA, I mean, we could put it on there and just remove that question altogether. Yeah, and, I, and again, to your point about support, I mean, we're a huge supporter of other providers in the city and we certainly want to see um, as, you know, as many, quality homelessness services as possible, but we also don't want people to go down this rabbit hole when the, the data collection is very difficult and it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I will I will go back to um, my team because we pulled down the, the VESTA required intake form, the update, and if I can get permission, then I will I will push it out to you guys and then you could share it, you could share yeah. it. Yeah, so we'll- I, But I need, I have to get permission from the COC because, uh -huh. you know, I think I'll, I know. I'll just check them. But I think that, quite frankly, I mean, we're, we were we were PDFing it and going to upload it. So to me, it's public okay. information. It's nothing. Yeah, on, yeah. Honestly, that crossed my mind too. That like a lot of this is probably ready in HMIS, but like Elliot says, we don't have access to everything on our end too. Like, oh, and I and I'm happy so, if if that's so if that's something that's helpful. And I think especially like to Sotia's point, it's like we need. To, and and I am actually, I don't want anyone to recreate the wheel. Why would you have to recreate a, a form when in fact you're going to be required to use yeah. the event? Like why? So um, let me see what I can do. And if possible, I'll push that out with the, with the caveat that you're confirming, you will push it out to everybody and yeah. put it up on the website. Yeah, we will, because we will put it on. So we do have a <laughs> section on with grant. Uh, we'll put it on the grant compliance documents section where the CDBG stuff is as well. I mean, I think that would be the best place for people to take a look at. Um, so we'll actually get rid of that that question on the application. I mean, we don't have any submittals anyways right now. So, I mean, so for us, I mean, that's an easy fix that we could get rid of it. It doesn't necessarily look like anyone else has any questions, but um, we are here um, for the next about two weeks to answer any questions for you guys. If you need anything, I mean, I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving um, and whatever you celebrate. I mean, if we don't talk before, have a good, good holiday season and reach out to us if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Too. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.